um, that she has been there since September last year. Yeah, August. August. Yes. Um, and, she, and I actually asked her um, to share a bit about both her story of how she got to do campus ministry um, and, and also what campus ministry is like. I know I was telling her that we have a really strong connection in our Covenant Church with East Carolina's campus ministry. Uh, but their campus ministry is different than Duke's, and next week we'll hear more about Chapel Hills, which is also slightly different because of the proximity to University Press. So uh, what a gift it is that, one, our presbytery supports five campus ministries. That is rare, um, but it matters, and it's a reason why our presbytery is incredibly healthy. So I do um, want to point that out. But I'm going to turn it over to her and let her share her story for a little bit, and then she's going to, um, she's got handouts. Does everybody have the handouts? There's two. One that we produced, um, and then she is an overachiever and wanted a separate one for you to study, and there will be an exam. <laughs> All right, come on. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Does, is my mic working well? You can all hear me. Okay, good. Um, as Ben said, my name is Libby Boney. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored that you all um, asked me to come speak. I'm newly ordained and not from the South and so, or from the PCUSA originally, so I'm always eager to meet uh, Presbyterians and learn about congregations um, in my area. So I have a study prepared, uh, and I hope I hear you all ask a lot of questions. I'm hearing great things about this congregation, but before I, I do, before we dive into the Beatitudes, um, shall I pull this out a little? Is it too? Okay. Before um, we dive into the Beatitudes, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and what I do as a campus minister at Duke. Hopefully you can put aside the fact of where... I work and know that even even people at Duke need the Lord right um, so and my husband is a Carolina fan so I think we balance each other out yeah um, so I am originally from st. Louis Missouri and I grew up in the uh, Presbyterian Church in America PCA I bet many of you are familiar with that it's one of the churches that broke off of um, they might not say that, but it's, it's an, another Presbyterian denomination, um, the second largest one to this one. And uh, unfortunately, they don't ordain women. And so I had never had, um, in my mind, ministry was just not a possibility that I ever entertained. I had never seen a woman, you know, pass the offering plate, um, let alone, you know, stand behind a pulpit. Um, and I grew up very entrenched in church life, though. Uh, I went to Christian schools all the way through high school, preparatory schools. Um, I ended up at a Christian college uh, in Chicago called Wheaton College. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Okay. Um, it's where Billy Graham went to school. I bet you've heard of him. So, um, so I ended up at, at that school and, and loved it. And strangely enough, that's where I fell in love with theology and learned that the Bible and the Christian faith are complicated and not just a single monolithic story, that there's a lot of um, beauty in studying scripture and learning about the nuances and the histories of our faith and the different voices um, that have spoken into church life and community. And I had some very influential professors who said, you should just go to seminary. And, and I thought they were crazy. And, uh, and I ended up getting a scholarship to Duke Divinity School, kind of on a whim. Um, and it was a really, it was a really difficult journey um, going there because I was told a lot of things about how sinful I was and um, yeah, a, lo a lot of things like that because women don't go to seminary where I come from. And um, I ended up at Duke Divinity School and slowly, uh, slowly took on more pastoral roles in internships and taking preaching classes. And my first job out of seminary was to work at First Presbyterian Church Greensboro, which is a 3,000 member congregation, 3,000 yeah, member congregation. Um, and they have a residency program where you can, young seminary graduates can kind of see what ministry life is like in a church where, you know, they wouldn't normally hire a 25 year old to, to work in. And so that was a wonderful experience for me, but I couldn't bring myself to become an ordained minister um, for many reasons. And a lot of it was my background. So um, I left ministry and worked at a um, 
in corporate America for a little while, um, but I had always been drawn to college students. And when the job opened at Duke um, as a campus minister, I, um, I, I felt a pull to apply because I really, really enjoy working with college students. I think they ask marvelous questions. They're, they're extremely flexible um, in terms of, you know, I can kind of do creative and off the wall things. Um, I love that I get to be a part of their daily life and you become close with the students very quickly. And so I ended up uh, as the campus minister um, just in, in August of 2017. Um, and then finally I became ordained in January. Um, it only took me, you know, seven and a half years <laughs> because uh, I just asked so many questions about ordination and um, yeah, I asked so many questions and I think not growing up PCUSA, it, it was just harder for me to take the leap. But um, it, my ordination service was wonderful and I'm grateful. Um, I'm grateful for this presbytery and to be serving as clergy in this area. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And um, yeah, campus ministry is a really unique, unique way to serve. Um, it's one of the few ways I know how to serve in, min in ministry, so it doesn't feel that strange to me, but um, campus ministry in the Presbyterian Church is modeled in many, many different ways. And as Ben said, all five of the campus ministries in this presbytery follow a different model. Um, so, at, so at Duke, the way we do it is that I am kind of a nonprofit executive director. We're our own nonprofit corporation, a 501c3 entity, and I report to a board of directors, which is um, kind of like they serve as a session almost, and they, they've hired me, and I'm in a called position in an ordained and called pastoral role, but um, it is a nonprofit organization, and we are supported by the presbytery and by uh, eight local Presbyterian churches in the Durham area, and then also by individuals who contribute to our ministry. Um, and so, so that, our structure makes us a little bit unique. But then, as an actual ministry with college students, we kind of serve as a congregation. Um, in fact, we do act as a congregation on Duke's campus. Um, and I have a student leadership team that acts kind of as a student session. We have, just like you all would, we have a, a treasurer, we have students who are doing outreach and communication work, who are doing um, community service and outreach, and who are um, doing pastoral care as well with other college students. And we worship together every Sunday evening in the Duke Chapel basement, um, which is a little less glamorous than the chapel. And a local congregation provides us with dinner. Um, and then we sit in a circle as a ministry and cram into the chapel basement and have a pretty traditional Presbyterian service of, of worship. Um, and these students, it's remarkable to see the kind of... Um, spiritual depth that they are willing to strive for. Um, we have weekly Bible study. This weekend, we're going on a retreat to focus and do a deeper dive on scripture and talking about life with God. Um, these students also uh, really are willing to serve one another um, and be Christ to one another. You know, uh, just like in a church, when someone's sick, you take them a meal. When someone, a big life event happens, you're there for them. These students are there for one another. And um, you know, research shows that when a kid turns 18 and goes to college, odds are they're not gonna darken a church door for a long time. There's kind of an 18 to 30 year old gap. And I believe that campus ministry is important because we fill, we fill that gap and teach students and give them the leadership um, ability and opportunity to be the church to one another and see the richness of church on their own and not just because their parents told them to go. And so then from campus ministry at Duke, we see students going to seminary, we see students becoming elders in their local churches. The first question they ask when they graduate is where can I go to church? Um, and I think that really campus ministry is nurturing the future of the Christian church um, and is slowly but surely spreading the gospel in its own um, quirky and weird ways as, as life with college students is always a little you know, unexpected and quirky. So I hope um, that explains a little bit to you about campus ministry and I love talking about campus ministry and I would love to talk to any of you um, about it tonight or over a cup of coffee um, 
anytime. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to share about it. But now, for the last you know, 20 minutes or so, let's talk about the Beatitudes, right? Just solve all the uh, questions from Matthew 5, 5 and 6. Um, so I've got, I, you know, these Beatitudes are, well, Beatitudes are well known. So I don't know if you all have Bibles in front of you or if I don't believe I put, the, silly me, I didn't put the actual verses on, on the handout. Um, but tonight, we are going to look at um, the, beati- the two Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, verses 5 and 6. So we'll shift gears to that. Um, and let me read them for us as we begin. And then hopefully we'll have time for some interaction and questions as we talk about them. Matthew 5, 5 and 6. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Um, Tonight, we're going to briefly look at the ways in which we approach life. Um, The the attitudes that we have, the things that we do, the actions that we take in life. We're going to see how those attitudes and actions maybe determine our life's purpose um, and the direction in which our lives are going. Um, And tonight, we're going to look at our life's purpose and our life's attitudes through the Christian faith, but through two words in particular meekness, meekness, and righteousness. I'll read the verses again. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Um, Now, I have not been a pastor for very long, but I can say that I do not use those words very much um, in my pastoral care or in my day-to-day job. Meekness and righteousness. Um, And you know what? My students don't use those words in campus ministry, meekness and righteousness very much. Um, And the environment that they live in at Duke University, the collegiate environment, it doesn't use the words meekness and righteousness to help those students derive purpose from their lives either. And I'm going to take a wild guess that in Tarboro on a day-to-day basis, you're not using the words meekness and righteousness to describe the way you all live. Um, if I had to guess. When I think about um, the way my students and the students I interact with, the way they think about their life's purpose, um, the way they would describe what they're striving for in life, some words that they might use rather than meekness or righteousness might be um, success, love, happiness. Um, They derive their purpose some from making money, or providing for their family, having a good life, a comfortable life. Uh, when When I talk with students or in pastoral ministry situations, I sense that people derive their purpose. They get their meaning in life from being seen or viewed as special, um, sensational, standing out. And these words, meekness, righteousness, they don't, really, they don't really promote those ideals, those values. Um, meekness, when I think of that word, it's more associated with quietness, gentleness, doing whatever, whatever people tell you to do. And righteousness, a righteous person, I personally associate kind of with legalism. Um, people who follow the rules, who are very by the book, And let me tell you, I do not bring students into campus ministry by being quiet or by being legalistic. Meekness and righteousness are not really things that I'm striving for um, in my day-to-day pastoral life. Um, And it's not just the college campus either, right? I think that even in our churches, we often want what is flashy, We measure our purpose by our numbers, by how good our programs are, how our building looks, how many young people are present. Um, I know all the time in my church congregation, I'm trying to get us to stand out. And so if we really value scripture as the word of God, if we're going to really take the words of Christ seriously, I think we've got to look at these Beatitudes and really try to figure out what they mean. Prayerfully discern together what it means to be people who seek meekness, 
who seek righteousness. So let's briefly talk about it. What does it mean? What does it mean that Christ was meek? Right? It's a funny word. I'm saying it so much, it's sounding funny on the tip of my tongue. What does it mean that Christ is meek? I envision um, a picture of, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, right? Mild is the word that I associate, I associate with meek. So the question I have for us is, is this what scripture really shows us? And so I, I looked in the Bible a little bit, and we see that this word meek um, in Greek found two other times in the book of Matthew. And that's what I have on the um, handouts that I gave you. Um, we, this word isn't used very often. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Um, just two times in the book of Matthew, and then one other time in the New Testament. Um, so in Matthew 11, you'll see on your handout, I've bolded the word, you'll see in verse 29, it says gentle and humble. That's the exact same word that the Beatitudes translate as meek. Um, and I'm going to read it for us, for us briefly. Matthew 11, 25 to 30. This is one of Jesus's brief teachings um, in the gospel of Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So for I am gentle and humble in heart could be replaced, for I am meek in heart. Um, So when I look at this passage and I think, huh, where does this word meek fit into the passage? Um, I see that this, if you look at the context, in Matthew 11, we see that Jesus is relying on God. Jesus is relying on the will of the Father, and then Jesus invites his own followers to rely on him as he relies on the Father. And so when I see this, this word meekness, I wonder that maybe it's linked to reliance and trust in God. Okay, so that's what I'm seeing. The word meek maybe relates to trust, reliance, in God. Then the other place in the book of Matthew, the second verse on your handout, that we see this word meek, translated as humble in the NRSV, is in Matthew 21. And it's when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, knowing that he is about to be crucified on the cross at the end of the week. It's the start of Holy Week that we're coming upon soon. Um, And in Matthew 21, we see that Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy. And Jesus says, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, Christ is humble. He is meek on the back of a donkey. And what is he doing in that holy week? He's fulfilling prophecy. He's submitting to the plans that God had for the world. This, this God man, Jesus God, who is fully God and fully human, submits to the plan of salvation. That is what his meekness, his humility is. So when I look at this word, blessed are the meek, I think that Jesus, you know, my initial thought, I associate the word meek with mild, but I don't think that mildness is a good synonym for the word meek. When I see Jesus submitting to God's will, you know, for the sake of being cheesy, you know, Jesus isn't meek and mild. It's more that he's meek and kind of wild. Um, Because yes, Christ submits to God. That is what it means to be meek. Christ's will and the will of God were in alignment. And this meant that he was tenderhearted toward the poor. This meant that he was willing to sacrifice his life for us and our salvation. This meant that Christ washed the feet of the disciples. It meant that his life was lived in service. That's what it meant to be meek. But Christ was by no means mild. 
If we think about Christ, he was born into controversy and his life stayed controversial. He challenged the religious leaders of his day and time and again, we see him putting the disciples in their place, telling them they're doing the wrong thing a lot of the time. Jesus says wild things in the gospels like sell everything you have and give to the poor. Forget about your families, just come follow me. And then Jesus, you know, he rises from the dead. There's nothing weak or mild about Christ. Rather, meekness isn't, isn't a kind of lame, doormat kind of adjective. Um, it means that Christ was in full alignment with God the Father. That is what meekness means, I believe, if we look at scripture. So then secondly, um, righteousness. We have the first beatitude, blessed are the meek, but then the second, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now the word righteousness, it appears a lot more times in the New Testament. Um, it appears six times in the book of Matthew and over 80 times throughout the whole New Testament, right? Righteousness is a lot more of a churchy word than um, meekness, I think, in my experience. Um, and this biblical understanding of the word righteousness, it's pretty complicated uh, if you look at it. Righteousness um, at its base level is kind of a legal term. To be righteous means to be um, innocent of a crime. Um, a lot of times in the Old Testament, God's righteousness uh, is used to depict God as true, God as reliable, God as just. But I think Jesus and the overall biblical understanding of the word righteousness is more diverse than just um, a legal term. In Jewish, in Jewish writings, we find that righteousness is more about finding truth. It's more about just following the law. Rather, righteousness in, in ancient Jewish writings includes um, generosity. Is a, is a concept that's closely linked with righteousness, as well as giving aid, charity, alms. So a righteous person, yes, they follow the law, but they also go above and beyond the law in um, righteously giving generously, um, in giving aid, in giving alms, in giving charity, in being a loving person in general. Um, and I think that this definition of the word righteousness is more in line with Christ's teaching and Christ's action. Righteousness isn't about some legalism, right? Where you toe the line, you follow all the laws, you do exactly what is right. Rather, it's about love and generosity as well. And now the, the Beatitude says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which seems to imply um, that righteousness is not an easily attainable virtue, right? Um, if the best we can do or that all God calls us to do is to desire righteousness, to hunger and thirst for it, it's really hard to be righteous. And I think that's because ultimately, righteousness isn't about us living by certain laws. It's about rather what we see throughout scripture, which is receiving the righteousness of God as a gift. Throughout the New Testament, we see the phrase righteousness of God a lot. Um, and it is through Christ that God generously and lovingly gives us God's own righteousness. Um, so righteousness, rather than thinking of it as legalism, when Christ is talking about righteousness, he's talking about thirsting for the righteousness of God that is given to us through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So that is kind of a little bit of background on how Christ lived out meekness and righteousness, these two uh, beatitudes, two words that we don't use very often, but are very, uh, very evident in Christ's own life. So the question then, I think, is what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us to be Christians who are both meek and who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Um, and I would love to hear, to hear your thoughts on this. Um, and briefly, you know, to close, 
what do we do with these new kind of definitions of, right, of meekness and righteousness that Christ has kind of flipped on their heads of things that we might normally associate with meekness and righteousness? Um, I think that meekness, these are my own musings, meekness, when we see it not as a form of weakness, we see it as a source of strength and reliance on God. Um, I envision that meekness can change my life because it means that I am no longer susceptible to the sensationalism of the world around me. You know, the world around us is filled with loudness, with selfishness, with self-promotion, with hatred, um, with seeking attention and success. Rather, for me as a Christian, I am only susceptible to the will of God. And meekness, for me, might be shown by serving and living without seeking personal recognition, but by seeking God. This is not, you know, gentleness or weakness. This is a bold new way of living. Um, And righteousness is not just a legal term. If it's a term that means we love generously and is a gift from God, that God gives us God's own righteousness, Um, I think that that means, doesn't mean that I'm better than others and follow the law. Rather, it means that God has given me the ability to love generously. Um, That God's gift to me through Christ is a generous gift of love. Um, And so I believe, I hope that as we, you know, reflect on our life with God this Lent, we might think that the traits of meekness and righteousness are key components of our daily lives with God. Living a life of meekness, of righteousness, um, this is an act of worship. Uh, And it relates to Lent because it reminds us that in order to fulfill these beatitudes, in order to live the life that God calls us to, we can't do it alone. We need God Um, And we need the community of faith around us to be people with meek and righteous hearts. Um, And so now, oh, look at me, right? 714, right on time. Um, uh, I uh, I know that some of you might have to go. I know that you end at 715. But if there are any questions you had or reflections you had on um, what this beatitude, what you think of when you think blessed are the meek, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, These aren't, you know, the daily traits of love, joy, peace that we talk about in church a whole lot. Uh, And so what stands out to you or what reflections might you all have? Mm-hmm. To me, I think you can convey that to college students as well with the term not. If you hadn't seen Mr. Rogers' documentary. It's excellent, isn't it? Yeah. You know, what's wrong with being not? Hmm. And I, those are synonymous words for me rather than if you want to give something to young people rather than trying to choose meekness and righteousness. Yeah, so kindness. <clears throat> love of neighbor is what you see when you think of these two. Yeah, n- what's wrong with being nice? Yeah, kind to those around you. Yeah, thank you. I'm thinking of pride goes before fall and being the opposite of pride. Hmm. That those who um, are meek have a clearer path before them. They're not going to fall flat on their faces because they're continuously... Hmm. Not burdened by pride. Yeah. Meekness as the opposite of pride. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Wonderful. I hope that um, this evening you learned something new. I hope that you go home and maybe... um, reflect on the Beatitudes a little more. I know it makes me, it certainly made me reflect a lot more. Um, And so shall I close us with a word of prayer? Is that? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, let's pray together. I so admire that you, so many of you gather together each week in Lent to um, think about your faith, your life with God. So let's pray. 
Gracious God, uh, we're grateful that in all of the busyness of life and in all the places we could be this evening, we are here together to um, learn about you and learn how to love you and um, one another more. Um, I pray that this evening as we go out into our lives, um, that even though the words meekness and righteousness might not come up in our vocabulary, that you would um, give us the ability, empower us to be people of meekness and righteousness in your world. Um, people who seek your will and people who love generously. Um, we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that they had a lot of questions like you because you did a phenomenal job of um, explaining all of this. So um, thank you for being here. Um, Y'all can come up and ask your questions.